Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is David Chavern. I'm the president and CEO of the News Media Alliance, and this is our first episode of something we call News Take. Here at the Alliance, we're focused on helping news publishers create strategies and business models that are going to help them thrive for years to come. We're always exploring new event formats and topics to bring to our members and other people in the industry. And what we've heard is there's a need for some really deep perspective and insights around the whole range of innovation taking place in the industry. And there's a, a lot of it. And basically how different organizations are applying different theories and ideas to their businesses. So we decided to have some conversations about it and share those conversations with you. We're calling this series of discussions News Take. A News Take conversation isn't meant to be superficial particularly it's we are aiming to be a little bit more in the weeds we want to talk to people who are doing the real work and thinking around the business of news and we frankly want to be a little wonky ask some thorny questions share details so that you walk away saying maybe we got to try that or that's not something i'd thought of before so for our news inaugural news take conversation I wanted to speak to two leaders who bring a wealth of experience in providing some of the best local news experiences to the U.S. and growing loyal audiences. We're very happy to have with us Mike Oren, who's the chief product officer at the Dallas Morning News. He leads the teams responsible for all digital products, marketing, business intelligence, and digital audience. And prior to that, he was the president at Belo Business Intelligence, where he led marketing, analytics, product development, strategy, and sales for A.H. Below, the publisher of the Dallas Morning News. Jim Bernard is also with us. Uh, is senior vice president for digital at the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. He has responsibility for the company's portfolio of digital properties and operations. He also oversees dozens of other digital products, including the Trib's mobile apps, print replica edition, citypages.com, and several Minnesota high school sports websites. Jim joined the Star Tribune in 2010 from Dow Jones Market Watch. And prior to Market Watch, he had a series of executive positions at Dow Jones. We're extremely lucky to have these two very thoughtful big brains in the industry with us for this initial uh, take on news take. So with that, listen, I'm gonna give you both a lot of chance to speak. And uh, while I think you two are often on the same page, uh, I think you're not always on the same page, which is even more fun. Um, so let's start with a broad question. You know, what, one of the things, you, whenever we go to, uh, if you go to any event, any conference uh, uh, related to news, local news in particular, there's this mantra of know your audience, get to know your audience. Uh, and usually the discussion doesn't get much further than that, which is knowing your audience, I think is a good thing, but the application of that can be hard. And so, you know, I, I'll start with you, Mike, but if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, how do you think about both your typical reader and subscriber, maybe in, as those being different things, and how do you really do the mechanics of working to understand them, what they want, and what they want delivered to them? Yeah, and I think actually I would first even, I think we've got to, before we delve deep into that question, you have to even split that. Uh, one of the things that we've really been uh, finally facing up to, I think in the last year or so, is that print subscriber and that digital subscriber are very different people. And the gulf between them, I think, is bigger than we've all probably pretended uh, in, in recent years. Um, so, you know, for us, it's a combination combination of, of you know, quant and qual. And, and the quant is increasingly, uh, you know, around uh, digitally, the behaviors we can see, how people respond to content. Does it make them subscribe? Does it make them go deeper? Um, you know, in the last couple of years, we've started to get that kind of data on our e-paper. Um, and I don't think of our e-paper as a digital product. I think of our e-paper as another one of our print products that people may consume uh, on, on an iPad. Um, and look, and then we, we at least in the last uh, quarter or so, as we've been doing a lot of longer term planning, have done some qual research with those readers. And look, it's very clear at, at, a, at a generalized level, 
our digital readers want local breaking trending as fast as they can get it and in an easy to consume format. Yeah. And our print readers still want a complete package that includes national, international. They still, many of them look at that as their only news source for the day. Um, and, and they want a, a depth and, and a familiarity that isn't necessarily there for the digital readers. You know, the, the print readers, you, you add a page of comics or puzzles uh, to their e-edition and they, they lose their mind, they're overjoyed. Um, you can't get your digital readers to use a puzzles product because they use the New York Times or whatever. Yeah, so I just, yeah. I think we, we have to, we, we now keep almost an entirely separate pulse on the two. Um, and, and I think the big question is, you know, how do you attract more of the, the true digital? And then how are we retaining those print slash e-paper folks um and how do you bridge the gaps between the things that that are not that are unique between the two that's fascinating by the way and, and there's a well and then you have to get into how do you produce the content that satisfies them but one of the things i was trying to talk to somebody the other day about the print product uh and i was saying one of the beauties of it for some people is that it ends meaning you you can, can you can read the paper as a past tense verb, uh, which is an act that also is almost like good health. Like I ate good, ate a good breakfast, I jogged, and I read the paper, right? And not really interested in the fire hose of dissatisfaction. Meaning, ten minutes after you read it, you're feeling behind, right? And whereas you know, there's going to be that audience that really does want just to be the up dated thing that changes every hour and probably if it doesn't change every hour that's annoying to them is that is that a, a do you see elements of that in those two readerships yeah i mean it, it's funny as you said that i flashed back to a, a couple of years ago we did a focus group on some print changes that we were making and how to message it um and one of our longest standing subscribers a wonderful woman uh found out i was in charge of digital and pulled me aside and she said, I'm trying to use your website. I'm trying to get with it and use your website, but please stop with all the breaking news. And, and, and she, she, she literally said, she said, if the president is impeached at three in the afternoon, I don't want to know about it till six in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's annoying, right? It gets in the way of dinner. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, Jim, so how do you, uh, uh, you know, do you have a similar... Are you similar experiences? I mean, what's your, how do you think about this? I and mean, how are you guys uh, looking at this landscape of readers, subscribers, and, and how they consume? Well, first, I wanted to ask Mike. Mike's already said two provocative things oh, that I'm excellent. excited to uh, follow up with him on. The first one, Mike, is um, how do you think about the reader audience that is um, hybrid, the people who get um, like you said, you, you kind of put it into two distinct, first off, I think Mike and I would probably really object to the question's premise that there is a typical reader. Like there isn't really a typical reader. There are segments and through analytics and research and, you know, all the experiences we have with our customers, we're able to understand those segments. When I think about the print segment, Mike, I, I, I think about that segment having a group of people who are never going to come online that, that just not willing to like that wonderful story of the person doesn't want to know till the next day, which I love her. Um, <laughs> By the way, that that's probably much healthier. Just FYI. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, it's, but, but then there's, there's a, there's a set of people who are going to get that print product. They're going to use the print product and then they're going to use the digital product all day. There's a set of those people too. Do you see those people in your analytics and, and do you have a sense about whether they're more or less valuable to to the enterprise? Well, everyone is valuable. Every customer. <laughs> and, and I, say that, I say that not in jest, but I mean, look, we're in a business now where, where subscri subscription is the lifeblood, right? We've gone from the ad-driven world to the subscription-driven world. So we care about every segment. I mean, but you're, actually your, your question is fair because I mean, the print readers 
uh, it's much more revenue, obviously, than the digital readers and the hybrid readers go into that. But our data shows that that true hybrid, the one who reads the print paper and then gets on the website, is a very, very, very small segment. Uh, so I, we tend to generalize, I think, uh, partly because that segment's pretty small. And what they are is they're news junkies who we love, who they're going to consume everything we do. But I'm much more, I, I lose sleep more thinking about how do we keep those print people for as long as possible and how do we get the new pure digitals um, I think it's probably people like us who grew up on print, but are still, uh, you know, digital first that make up that, that wonderful small sliver of the true hybrid audience. But I just don't think it's that big. How big, do you know how big it is for you, for you, you guys? I'm looking it up for us right now. I don't have it off the top of my head, but, um, uh, I, I'd say it's under 10%. Okay, so for us, I'm just gonna do this like if you said show off. Sorry, <laughs> but I, it's a big audience for us. I mean, it's a it's a really big audience for us. I think. I mean, I don't know. You can decide. Um, in September, um, the print audience that is, well, I guess it's maybe it's not as big as I had hoped. The print, <laughs> the print audience. Um, that has a subscription and logged into the website is a third, a third of the print audience, 30%. Well, okay, and, audience. And, and I would say, look, if you go with just logged in once, yeah, we're probably it's, in about the same range. But logged in um, once over the course of a month shows that they're digitally active. I mean, to, you know, because it, you don't have to log in. Um, yeah. I guess this is where I'm, where I'm thinking about this. the other thing you said that I, um, I'm sure it's an issue of semantics, but um, I disagreed with was Absolutely. I think of the um, e-edition, or as they say in Dallas, the e-paper. Um, I think of that as being um, a digital product. In fact, I think of it as the gateway product for the for the digital transition. We have to get those people who are the print readers to use the digital e-paper e-edition. Um, because when there comes a time when I have to change their service because they live somewhere weird, we can't deliver to them anymore or whatever. And so we've been having kind of a big debate about whether or not how we should be incentivizing um, consumers to use the, um, the e-edition because we have some print consumers who pay for it. And we have other print consumers who aren't using it that I, I, I'm an advocate for giving it to them, saying, look, if you pay for print, you should use the e-edition because sooner or later, I'm going to take your print away. Yeah, Jim, right. can I interrupt you? Because this gets to a really interesting question, sort of how I took um, uh, Mike's initial commentary was you had a, uh, a, a print subscriber. And by the way, I've talked to Mike Klainsmith about this in the past, a, a print subscriber who really wants the buffet. Okay, they all they they want the salad, they want the this, they want the local international, uh, the comics at the back. You know, they they want that uh, whole buffet. Whereas uh, there is a you know maybe a, a digital oriented uh, uh, reader who you know may get their national from the New York Times or Washington Post and really wants to know what's going on with uh, uh, with the stars or or something intensely local. And so it was a, almost a content mix. Um, and how do you, and I, I was thinking that I was thinking maybe the e-edition is more of a content mix like the print paper, right? It's, it's got news it from the world. Print paper. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. How do you think about that, Jim? Um, I, I think that, that we have to meet readers with a product that suits them across all channels, including print. So I start, I start with like, we at the strip have invested heavily in print. We still have a very large um, newsroom. We still have a high quality print product. We're still investing in that. That's important. We have a huge audience that gets it. They pay a lot of money for it. We have a big investment in it. It's not going anywhere. And those customers are customers and we love them and they love the print product. We also have some of those, you know, we have any edition and an app and a mobile website and a high school website. Like we have a whole different ways. We have alerts and emails and 
and I just have to, I have to have a portfolio of ways that people can consume it. We have consumers like the, our audience research suggests that we have some consumers who we are appointment for them. You know, you can kind of see them in the analytics. You can almost hear their oatmeal being consumed. You know, it's like the same day. It sounds unpleasant. I have no, to tell you. It's, it's fine. If, they, if they're if they buying <laughs> the, the product, I'm delighted. But you can see that they arrive at the same time every day. They, you know, do the same number of page views. And then we have other people that are fitting us in during the day. They're doing two mobile page views while they're waiting in line. Right. And and so we, we serve all of those different things. The question I think that is... Um, that is important for us to think about is how are we investing in maintaining and growing those products to meet those consumer needs or to go beyond those consumer needs? And one of the things that's interesting, it's interesting based on this entire podcast, we've started the podcast and we're talking about print any edition. Yeah. Right. I mean, we've just spent 10 minutes talking about print knee edition. I could spend an hour talking about print knee edition, but I would propose that people in our industry are a lot more comfortable talking about print and e-edition. David, your question frames, and then you're like, oh, and print has all of these values. It's like, yes, it has all those values. But what I wake up every day and worry about is how am I converting new digital subscribers? Like that is where all of the energy that I want to spend on this, not that I want to disregard the e-edition, it's super important, but a very good e-edition uh, uh, you know, a, a nicely delivered thing with a vendor can satisfy a lot of people. Whereas trying to get people to write the right kind of content for mobile consumption at the right velocity is a much harder thing to do. And that's part of what our industry is still in a conversion. I'll say one other thing and then I'll, I'll pass, but um, no one tells you if the paper you delivered to their doorstep got picked up. Mm -hmm. Like Mike and I can go and have um, research studies all we want and ask people questions and we know it is getting picked up, but every single digital session, I can tell you exactly what they read, how long they spent on it, what they did next. And so in some ways, the, um, the print products usage is anecdotal. The digital products usage is precise. Yeah. And, you know, to that end, extent when we start to say well what are segmentations inside of that what should we do more of how do we convert like all of that universe is at a whole different level of kind of knowledge that you come to that conversation with the consumer on and that's a place where I feel like we're really growing we're not there yet which is understanding those consumers well enough to make sure that we're giving them uh, what they seek from us yeah, and yeah. by the way, it just and by the way, Jim, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't some nostalgic extolling the virtues of print. I really, what I was trying to get at is these, you know, there are these different. We're talking about audience, right? Know your audience, uh, but their audience expectations sometimes go like this, right? And uh, and so ha, ha, then it, get, it gets to the question you noted, which I'm going to ask Mike about, which is. Then, in terms of the producing the content and the mix, uh, you know, how do you how do you make sure you're producing the right content, the right places? Because you're right. Historically, we just repurposed the print stuff right. for this digital audience. And by the way, that's a bad idea. <laughs> okay, so uh, so then, how do you think about the whole content creation and optimization for these different audiences, Mike? Yeah, and, and real quick before I dive into that, I think I do want to pull out a little nuance, I think, in, in, in how Jim and I are, are, are maybe thinking about this. Where I was going on the e-paper is, is more of, it used to be my most despised product. I mean, it has- By you the, or by the readers or by who? By me, by me. Oh, and, and it, it has- it has all it has all of the liabilities of both mediums and none of the benefits of either. Um, however, when I started, and I've been doing you know local digital media my whole career, but when I started here at the Morning News, uh, rebuilding our digital stuff back in 2018, I had this starry-eyed vision of everybody in our community onto our website and using our .com products, right? And what I realized. Uh, from both studying the data and the anecdotes is, is look, I have despaired of any notion of getting a 70 year old print reader to start using our website if they aren't already. That's step part one of that. Part two of it is uh, 
print continues to be very important. It's not going away soon, but look, I'm going to draw a provocative line in the sand. Ultimately, local print is going away. And we've seen some of our peers out there, you look at the Tampas, you look at the Little Rocks, um, who have already largely gone down this road and you can see what, what's happening with them. And I think the, the most encouraging thing I've seen in that without going into their numbers is how much of that print audience they've been able to retain by continuing to do the e-paper product. And seeing that was a wake up call for me about a year ago that made me say, okay, this is not a product that we're going to sunset anytime soon. In fact, it will very likely outlive print. And we need to start seeing how we can get the diehard print readers accustomed to it. And that's why we've been doing things like, you know, bonus coverage of certain things and anything that we do cut out of print, we keep in the e-paper. And I think that's the, uh, the important piece of that. So you did ask a question that I didn't answer, which was about content and how we- Hang on, hang on, hang on. I want to- <laughs> All right, All right. Uh -oh. gonna, so, this, this is going to wind up time. being like the beat. This is going to wind up being like the Beatles Get Back series. Yeah, it's on hour seven of Jim and I talking about new papers. Oh my gosh, it's awful. Maxwell um, Silverhammer just for a couple right. hours. So, um, <laughs> so uh, first. I I 100% agree and have to totally plus one um, your experience with the e-paper, um, which is my experience as well, which was I came at this with a certain amount of digital arrogance. Um, you didn't say that, but um, uh, and I'll talk to it. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I've been at this a lot longer. I'm not going to say because it sounds makes me sound super old. But one of my first things I did when I got to the strip was I released an iPad um, uh, app. And I said, oh, what we'll do is we'll just move all the e-edition people over to the iPad app. Yeah. And we literally did that. And then they came and threatened to burn my house to the ground. <laughs> you know, we have, a, we have a joke that if we don't send the e-edition email out to people that says that the edition is available, that, you know, the call center is raised to the ground. These people love this product and it's a very good product. And, and I have a healthy and a respect for it, um, but a begrudging respect from a digital perspective because you think it's a PDF of a newspaper, but it's, but it's actually a very good product and it's helping those people a lot. Um, the second thing, Mike, I really am done talking about e-edition, but I would love to hear how your uh, incremental additions to the e-edition have been working because we've been thinking about that and people are always like, well, Dallas is doing it. I mean, is it, do you see um, extra engagement and retention and like, or, or is it just the kind of thing where people are like, thanks for not getting rid of that thing? Um, yeah, it varies. Um, so it is, hurts the journalist in my heart. Uh, the incremental page of puzzles and comics drove tremendous adoption. Uh, the extra Olympics wire coverage that we did, eh, nah, yeah. didn't, really, didn't really do much. Um, I had a conversation uh, a couple weeks ago with somebody at, I won't name, name the chain in case they didn't want to say this, but one of the chains who puts like 50 pages of extra stuff at the back of their e-paper every day, Right, it's sort of all the stuff that you used to get in the newspaper in the '80s when you know a Tuesday would be 120 pages, um, and they claim they're getting tremendous engagement on it. Um, and so we're we're thinking about some of that. Um, I, I think the 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 thing that we've not sorted yet, Jim, and that I think is going to be interesting to learn is we're learning a lot about print via the new data we have on the e-paper. If you can make the logical leap that the e-paper reader is not dramatically different from the print reader, you start learning that you have features in your, in your package that you thought were critical that nobody's engaging with. That's interesting. Um, you know, like we have the continual debate over the stock tables, yep. right? We want to take out the stock tables. Well, we tried that and everybody screamed and cried. Uh, so you can't touch the stock tables. Well, our e-paper tells us at least the e-paper readers of the print type product do not engage with our stock tables at all. So we might go revisit our thinking about that in print. So we have been starting to use the digital 
in print product development more. Hey, could I, so let's ask about the, the pure digital reader, right? So there, there's going to be a whole thesis that uh, you should only be doing local news, right? Uh, what's going on with the mayor, what's going on with sports teams, what's going on with COVID locally, and that that reader is going to consume national, international political uh, at someplace else, right? That you do what you're good at, they do what they're good at. Um, but that's sort of always struck me as a sort of esoteric argument like yeah in theory that uh that may be a good theory but is that really what your pure digital readers want do they do they just want to get your local stuff and they're going someplace else or do they want some of that buffet idea still i think there's a there's a key question when you ask what they want are there things they would like to read and that they will consume versus are there things that they will pay you for, right? Yeah. Um, I'll go away from national and international for a second to make the point. Readers always tell us they want arts and entertainment content and they will read it and engage with it and subscribers will consume it at a very high volume, but they never buy subscriptions off of it, broadly speaking, it does not, move move the needle i think national and international to an extent can be that way now we try and localize them all right it always makes me think of my favorite newspaper movie is the paper uh the michael keaton movie and where like they're sitting there in that new york newsroom going through all the news of the world and it was like you know an earthquake happened here but no one from new york right and then this time and then finally they get to wow. like a train derailment with like two guys from the bronx like, so I think we can, we think about national and international that way, um, where you, you can localize it. Yeah, I think, and we probably haven't done enough testing on it. I think re readers might want it more than we give it to them, but they sure as hell aren't going to pay the Dallas Morning News for the latest on what's happening in Europe. Yeah, it's a, a Jim, what's your kind of take on that? Um. Readers want, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, readers want um, short, frequent, mobile-friendly articles about the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> they want that in Minneapolis? That's pretty impressive. Yeah. They must be America's team. Yeah, well, no, we get we get a lot of Minneapolis readers. You know, it, <laughs> you know it, 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 I'm, I'm glad you said that, Jim. So we have a, uh, a new editor here, Catrice Hardy, just joined us here a few months ago. Um, and, and look, her, one, her big focus is breaking and trending, breaking and trending. And, and to your point, we've already started making a transition where we used to write one really long article about a thing. Now we do four short ones and you've got the breaking news and then you've got the, you know, the update, you've got the, what it means, you've got the explainer on. So yeah, we're very much following that model, um, breaking, trending, fast, short. Um, Cowboys, yes, is big for us nationally, but even bigger, real estate, uh, dining, restaurants opening and closing, um, and, and high school sports, right? So, I mean, again, gets back to the, the, the truly local nature um, so yeah, I think you have to look at it in two vectors of like, what is the type and format? And then what are the verticals that people care about? Um, and I don't know if you find the same ones, but I mean, for us, number one is real estate and number two is dining. Yeah. Well, one, one thing that we know is that the more broadly read somebody is, the more that they're likely to subscribe. And the more that they come, they're more likely to subscribe. So one challenge when we talk about what readers want is that Mike and I are working with newsrooms where we're always trying to give them ideas about a single thing that they're going to do. But the reality is that we still are a bundle product and we have to have a robust bundle for the people who are going to find enough value in it to continue to pay it. And, and so, you know, I, my, my joke about sports is that I know that I could find audience for more uh, local information about sports. Um, uh, but if, if I'm gonna convert those people, I need to have a good opinion section. 
I need to have a great business section. I need to have restaurant reviews. And it's not until people are tipping over to three to five visits and a bunch of times hitting the meter before they finally get there. And they can't get there if you don't have a lot of high quality content. So what's What's interesting about um, the premise is if you were trying to scope it all the way out, you would say, what we need is um, information about things that Minnesotans care about, lots of it, um, as much as we can possibly produce with the, with the team we have. And as long as somebody cares about it, I'm going to get some interaction that's going to move them closer to a decision. And so that's kind of an equivocation. It's not as, as satisfying as saying restaurants reviews are killing it. You know, if you talk to the folks at Newsday, they have like a they have a, a theory or they have a they have a, a, a calculation and they can tell you precisely what the incremental lift of a given thing is. I admire that, but at some level, I'm not sure that I'm going to change the coverage as much as to say to my news team, hey, you need to write stuff that looks good on mobile and you need to write stuff that people care about and you need to write more stuff. Yeah. yeah so hey, uh, hey, go on. David, real quick before we go on, because I want to I want to yes and Jim in a big way on this. And I've got a, a concrete example that will echo you. So um, we had uh, up until this year, we had a subscription you could buy to the entire digital suite. And then we had a much cheaper subscription that you could buy to sports only. And then we had an even cheaper subscription you could buy to high school sports only. And mainly to simplify the business, we, we, we discontinued both the sports only subs and you know went back to, if you're gonna subscribe, you're gonna buy the whole buffet. We have sold more than triple the number of high school sports driven subs to the entire product this year than we sold to the sports only that was cheaper thinking that there were people who only wanted sports. Uh, so so the, the, the thesis there goes back to Jim's point of you got to have the overall buffet and it is easier for me to get a Dallas sports enthusiast interested in our whole suite of products than by getting them to pull out their wallet just to pay for sports. Um, and I think that 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 does make a lot of this uh, uh, analytic piece a little bit harder because you have to then figure out, well, what is the right melange of stuff? Like yeah. we, 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 we've gotten very focused on it and we're still not doing enough on it. Um, but, but we saw that when people started consuming from an additional section, they were very likely to quickly subscribe. So I've been reading all sports and then I, I trip into an art story and start reading there, right? So to Jim's point, you want the newsroom creating a lot of content across a lot of areas. And then from like a product perspective, you got to figure out how you serendipitously encourage that lane skipping. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to shift gears here a little bit. I want to talk about other formats, audio and and video and how you think about them. You know, again, as a point of theory, let's say, um, you guys create lots of local news content that was always the seed corn for TV news, radio news, everything, right? You, you always created this stuff that was then delivered in these other formats. A, B, Unlike the past, you don't need a federal license to get into the video or audio business anymore, right? You, it's uh, the audiences are migrating, probably slower than people expect, but migrating to digital spaces with audio and video products. And you can get into that with a camera and a good microphone. May not be great at it, by the way, which is another topic, uh, but you know, the barriers to entry are relatively low. And there are other monetization opportunities in those spaces, right? Uh, uh, video ads still do pretty well. You know, audio is sort of figuring out the ad unit question. But, you know, at the end of the day, again, you have the raw material and you, we've talked about e-edition and print and digital. You know, how do you think about these other spaces uh, as places where you can deliver that content. Obviously you have the New York Times that's done pretty well with their podcast products. 
there's not a, by the way, everybody always says that. And then the long list of other people who've done well with their news podcast products is pretty short. Uh, but, you know, how are you guys wrestling with these questions about taking your content and delivering it someplace else? First, David, I'm so glad that you brought up the New York Times. Mike and I are delighted to hear our products compared to the New York Times because that's something that we can easily say, well, we're not the New York Times, you know, like, like we don't have huge, you know, hundreds of people. I mean, you might as well be comparing us to Netflix. So anyway, I'm teasing, but I, I, um, I, well, um, I love it. I'll tell you a joke about it. I used to deal with somebody who talked about uh, education policy. And if you hear people talk about colleges, oftentimes Harvard gets injected into the conversation. Well, yeah. And in a similar way, it's really hard to talk about news publishing without these sort of lodestone, like what's yeah. the Times doing? Everybody yeah. reacting to it. Yeah. And really what I'm trying to get at here is how your perspectives are are different, right? Yeah, so so here's the way that we think about it. Instead of, you know, buying cereal, which would be awesome. Yeah. Um, what we what we do is we have a culture of a, a, a kind of experimentation and exploration that is not tied to specific business goals. So basically I love how the newsroom takes a new thing and turns it into a storytelling tool whether it's a video or we have an incredible sports podcast, you know, a couple of guys in the sports team decided to do that. Um, we have, we have an amazing Instagram daily stories feed. And every time, uh, you know, my kids and millennials on my team are like, our Instagram is amazing. Right. And that just happened because we had some people who did it and they were an experiment. They didn't come and ask for like, Hey, what's the PL on Instagram. They just went ahead and did it. And that culture of experimentation really allows us to be in all of those places in ways that are interesting, that we learn, and that help. It's important and it's useful as long as it doesn't pull focus from selling full price digital subscriptions. Because all I really care about is paying, is getting people to pay full price for digital subscriptions. Yeah. So it's, it's totally fine if you want to do video. Um, and I can tell you how many subscriptions come from that if you care, but for the most part, you know, there's enough room in the system for people to do experimentation and for us to be on those platforms. As I mentioned earlier, we have a huge number of platforms we already have to be in and maintain. And so there's a limited amount of newsroom resources. Our newsroom, both from a creativity standpoint and from a resourcing standpoint, I feel like gets the tone right of being there without over investing in it to a point where it's like, yeah, well, that's great, but we actually didn't have anybody sell subs this month. So um, that's kind of where we are in terms of all of these other things. We don't really look at them from a straight ROI standpoint. Um, I don't think video from an ROI standpoint is ever going to pay out. So but that's that's really interesting. And the key point being the monetization around it, while pleasant, whatever it is, is compared to one digital subscriber, you know, one new subscriber. This sort of gets back to the debate we can have about micropayments. And that's the last time I'm gonna mention that term on this. No, podcast. let's not go there. Yeah, where, you know, all of this effort, this hamster wheel churn over here compared to, you know, one subscriber is not a good balance. Is is that kind of similar idea? I mean, the thing is, David, I, I don't think it would make much sense for, us to look at every single thing inside of a bundle and every different platform and every different thing that a journalist could do today and say, let's quickly attach a, a hardcore ROI analysis to that because that wouldn't lead us to have the rich product we have. No one was ever going to create subscriptions using Instagram when they first started, but I'm sure Instagram is helpful in, in making awareness that will sell subscriptions over time. And also, it's a great storytelling tool. They're doing a great job. And so, you know, it's a big newsroom and there's room for them to do that. So from my perspective, I, I, I look at it more like we got to have a portfolio of different places that we are and we need to have room to experiment because everything evolves. Um, you know, what, what actually sells subscriptions are visits to the website for print content. <laughs> right. Well, and, and that, that's, you know, I think that that's exactly the right attitude. And I think that the only thing we, we have to watch and we try and be careful of is you, you want to encourage the experimentation and, and dabbling here and there and let people follow their, their passions. But then there comes the question of, are we investing in this as a company, right? Are we actually, are we making this 
channel a priority this year. Um, and I think the only way our experience really differs from Jim's is uh, we, for instance, on audio and video, we went uh, probably seven, eight years ago, all in in a big way, spent a lot of money, didn't get a lot of return. And that actually made us probably a little too gun shy on the experimentation side. Uh, but we've got a lot of smart folks in the newsroom who have started swinging back a little bit and, and dispelling the myth of like, oh, we never do audio. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we're, have, we're, we're, we're getting smarter about it and picking shots, but it's not like, you know, as we're planning out next year and we're looking at where we're going to really focus strategies, we're talking about breaking and trending. We're not talking about audio and video specifically, uh, you know, beyond how they organically happen. Yeah, it's interesting. And and also one of the things people always underplay is uh, quality execution. Uh, You know, let's take video, for example. Uh, You know, lighting matters, right? The sound sound matters, right? I think for a while there was this thesis that everybody could just set up an iPhone and create compelling uh, video content. And, you know, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. You know, on the audio side, the host really matters. Right. Is this some is the host a compelling person? Because that's a very ultimately kind of intimate medium. Right. Is is the host really matters? So, you know, how you do it also matters. That's really interesting and, um, and thoughtful. I I want to, you know, last couple minutes we have here, I want to dig into some of the things on the technology side. Um, what in, in thinking about where the industry is and where it can go? By the way, one of my originating theory thesis that uh, is that people, I still think people don't understand that you both have much bigger audiences than ever, than in history, right? You have many, many, many more people touching your content than in ever the dreamy print, uh, golden era of print, right? It is, so you have the, the, you don't have an audience problem at the end of the day, there's demand for what you do. Uh, it's it's monetization and the, I'll put on my advocate hat. I'm not ask. Uh, I get paid to fight for a digital marketplace that compensates the content. But at you know at the end of the day, uh, it is this connection between this great content and the audience and what happens in the, in between. Um, and you know it's been a struggle certainly for the industry to to climb up the technology ladder. Struggle for any kind of industry. What do you think? The industry does better than people might expect. Um, and where do you think the biggest holes are? Where could we, where do we really need to make investments as an industry? Or what are the, where do we need the most help or the most um, input in terms of, you know, tech, you know, the technology behind taking our great stuff, our great professional expensive content and connecting it with audiences in ways that pays the bills? Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I like I, you got both Jim and I kind of kind of silenced here. Excellent, that's fantastic. Uh, that was my goal. No, like, yeah. what do you what do you think we do? Uh, we we've gotten to where we do pretty well. Like, I, I get that we didn't used to do stuff well, but what do you what are you really proud of in terms of uh, your technology and uh, and how you're thinking about connecting the content with the audiences? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you one that's both that we do better than people think and that we, um, that we have a long ways to go, which is uh, creating digital subscriptions. I mean, that, you know, 10 years ago, we weren't doing that at all, right? Yeah. Um, and we found our way to a place where many, many, many people buy digital subscriptions online from us and they transact and they give us a credit card and we send them a bill and, you know, that whole universe is um, incredibly complicated. Um, subscription um, systems are not as simple as they look. So things like um, when your subscription comes up and all of that stuff, I'm not going to use the word dunning, but like there's a, there's a whole complicated universe in there that we do pretty well at. Um, and, and I think sometimes consumers who, you know, go to Amazon and click on a thing and it shows up, think of that as being really straightforward and it's not actually straightforward. So um, that I think we, we actually um, do pretty well at. Um, I think the thing that we're not, I feel like is something we're not doing very well on is account management. 
like just the mechanics of, um, you know, how to interact and have a relationship with a brand online, in part because we have a lot of legacy systems that are complicated and difficult to use. And those legacy systems, um, you know, are serving a legacy product. So they're unmovable in some ways. You can't say, well, let's just not use those things because they actually are also doing a good job of delivering a print newspaper. And so that comes across sometimes in digital awkwardness around um, why is it that I can go to Netflix and or Spotify and make these kinds of choices about my relationship with you? And it's very hard to do at the Star Tribune. Um, so, you know, that would be a place where I feel like as an industry, if we're going to become more circulation and subscription based, we need to get more aggressive about um, managing those relationships digitally. I'll give you one quick example. If you don't pay your, uh, if your credit card goes wrong, um, then you go into a process that will have us sending you a print bill. That's so suddenly you'll be, a, you'll be a digital consumer, you'll be getting a print bill. And if you pay that bill, we'll just keep sending you print bills. Now you probably don't want print bills, right? Yeah. And maybe you do, in which case we're happy to do it. But there's just this kind of like, well, that's just because that's what we do. And it turns out a bunch of those people will continue to pay. So you can't just stop doing it, you know? So re, re, reconfiguring that entire process is very hard. It's a business process um, challenge that involves lots of different systems and it doesn't instantly turn into a bucket of revenue that you can put on a PL and get people excited about. So that, that those are the kinds of boring projects that I think we still have in front of us. To, to validate that, I was a little this call because our subscriptions leader was in my office and we were banging our heads against the wall about the middleware that talks between our print and hybrid subscribers and our digital subscribers and what we were or were not going to invest in improving that this year. Um, so we, I, there's a lot of folks who will hear this who have the same problem. Okay. You know, I think that where we where we have a a a more visible kind of technology problem uh, that that we have to solve. It's more of a business and consumer expectation problem. Um, and, and I'm going to go back to where Jim was like, "Thanks for comparing us to the New York Times because we're nothing like the New York Times." However, you know, the, the stats, uh, the, the research out there tells you that you know the average consumer is only going to buy five or six digital subscriptions. Only one of them is going to be news. Um, you know, it may not be as as stark in uh, in Minneapolis, but I can tell you the New York Times has a lot more digital subscribers in Dallas, Fort Worth than I do. Uh, and the average consumer does not think about us that differently from them. They have the same expectations of us that they have of them. Um, and so, for instance, you know, we put most of our development thought and emphasis on the dot com. The, 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 the web product. Um, you know, uh, one of our board members corralled me yesterday for 20 minutes showing me all of the deficiencies in our app versus the New York Times app, uh, which, which he's not wrong. And all of the things that he likes about the New York Times app, I would love to do. And we work with a great, very competent vendor who provides us a nice off-the-shelf app that roughly, I want to say, 5% of our digital consumers engage with. Yeah. Um, but the fact is, we are all in competition with the Washington Post and the New York Times, whether we like it or not. And we are not entirely at parity in terms of what we can do product-wise just because of budgets um, yeah. and, and size and scale. Um, and I think that's going to be an ongoing struggle because I have a hard time making my next door neighbor ex understand why my app doesn't do this thing. Um, you know, and that can be as 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 uh, esoteric as a a groovy interactive feature, or it could be as simple as them not understanding why Facebook, Twitter, Safari, and their email program all have different browsers and they have to log in every time they access us through a different app on their phone, right? Like yeah. these are the kinds of problems that I think comes down to the consumer focused things that we all completely can rationalize why they're the way they are, but the person paying us has no, no understanding. 
Yeah, because it's a, yeah, it's it's on their menu of choices, right? Uh, so they compare and contrast. That's really interesting. And by the way, this discussion has been fantastic. I really appreciate it. We are going to end this way, which is, you know, it's near the end of the year. We all and it's the time for a great optimism. And there's a lot of reason, actually, I think, for optimism in a lot of spaces. Uh, what are you excited about for 2022? Uh, so uh, either one of you, dive in and, and let me know. What are you excited about for the year ahead? Well, I'll get for, for us just specifically um, in our organization, I really feel like um, our product group and our newsroom are super aligned. Um, and and uh, the existing team, you know, with with Catrice, um, they're starting to do all the things that in the product meeting team we've been going. God, if the newsroom would only do that. Um, so you know, I'm 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 hopeful for us that that this is the year that that a plan comes together. Excellent, Jim. Well, I, I hope that's right. Uh, I hope that for you too. Um, uh, the, the thing that um, we are excited about next year is that we are looking at trying to differentiate the subscriber experience from the non-subscriber experience. So we have a punch list of about you know, more, more ideas than we can deal with, more than we'll be able to do, but we seem to have a consensus that um, it's important from a retention and acquisition standpoint to create new products that are subscriber-only products. and um, in the past, that's often been a differentiation about like ad density or, you know, the meter, which tend to be negatives. And we're starting to look at those more as a positive. So uh, one idea that the New York Times has executed that we admire is the um, subscriber share an article. And mm -hmm. I feel like if I can get subscribers share an article out, it will help me with audience development. It'll help me with subscriber retention. It'll help me with subscription acquisition. And that's not easy, but that's the kind of idea that we're looking at for next year. And this last year was a very successful year for us, but a lot of things that we did this last year were really um, back-end systems, you know, boring things that, um, that set the table for the things that are really gonna be meaningful for consumers. Um, and some of those will look like parody to New York Times, but for our audience, if I can get, you know, if I can get a handful of people to do those shares, or we also have some ideas around audio, getting like read an article function for subscribers, um, might not be all that complicated, and um, I think would be a nice addition. So, um, so that's you know, those are the things that I think. When we get excited, it's about, you know, doing something that makes consumers excited because that's the thing that obviously we're all here to do. That's really fantastic. And as I think you both know, I'm a real optimist about the local news uh, industry. At the end of the day, you have to be compelled by the idea that you create something people want and need and that it's rare and valuable. And, you know, we will figure out the rest. It's hard, by the way, but we will. We will figure out the rest. Listen, I really can't thank you guys enough. Mike Oren, Jim Bernard, two of their uh, best, uh, most fantastic thinkers in the local news business. This has been a great conversation. Very much appreciated. I hope everybody has a really great holiday. Thanks, David. Thanks. Thank you.